privilege of being heirs of God. Uh, hallelujah. We started last week with talking about the benefit of justification. And we have looked at some of these benefits already. Whether we were before in Christ, we were enemies. We were separated from God. We didn't know God. And then suddenly we realized that, uh, uh, go to the next slide, Andreas. We will do a review from last week. Therefore, since we have been justified by, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we developed the last week. And we look in the chapter 5 to some of the benefits already. But let me just uh, look at verse 2 that you have here. We already see some of the benefits here. We have already obtained access into the experience of grace. So your life and my life right now is just look like uh, something ordinary. We, and many times we don't understand fully what it means and the privilege that we have received, the, the undeserved privilege that we have received. To have gained access, imagine we were enemies, we were separated, we were dead in our sins, and we were by nature children of the wrath of God and, and hell. Stay, stay there with me, please. And then we have changed and to being justified, we have been declared right with God. So that changed our relationship with God, that changed our life, that changed our future. We have gained access to a world of grace, to a walk with the grace of the Lord and to our life, to experience God's grace in which now we live. So we're talking about a now life, not a past life, but a now life. This is what we live. And the last part that I really like, and we boast because of our hope in God's glory, we're looking forward to something glorious, something tremendous, and that brings us like a, a joy. And here we use the word boast, but it's also boast means rejoicing. We, we look with a, a deep conviction and anticipation with a certainty we look at that and it it brings uh, hope and confidence into our life so this morning i want to uh, continue on this one especially the hope of god's glory because it's very important for you and for me as we walk in our own trouble as we live our daily life, as we go under the pressures of life, as we go with the conflicts, as we walk in a fallen world, a world that is hurt, a world that is aggressive, a world that is hard to, to deal with, and a, a world where th that we come out of. We, we come out of a world just like that, a hurt, aggressive, angry, hostile, bitter, and all this. So we have to continue to live in this world. So it is very important that we look up to something, that we have a, a hope, an anchor somewhere, a, a compass that shows us the directions and something that when we are uh, unmotivated, discouraged, or feel uh, resourceless or hopeless, we can remind ourselves we're not hopeless. We rejoice in the hope of God's glory. So we want to continue continue uh, to expand on the hope of God's glory this morning and introduce another tremendous benefit of being justified. And we find it in the next slide, Romans 8, 17. And if we are his children, then we are his, his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance, if indeed we share in his suffering so that we may also share in his glory. Now, when we look to the letters of Paul to the Romans, it's like climbing a ladder. Each step gives you a bigger view, a different uh, angle to look at. Every step leads to another one. You keep on climbing the, the ladder. It's the book of Romans. So in chapter 8, verse 1, we start with, there is now no more condemnation. So we start with, with this, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So right now, you find that uh, in Romans 8, no particular identity, no condemnation for those who are. Those we have no name there, no specific titles, no specific identity for those, anyone who are in Christ Jesus. Then the following verses have to deal with the Holy Spirit, and it concludes just before verse uh, 14, verse 13 says, the, the, we have choice of either living under the control of our sinful nature, 
to continue in this way. We were slaves to that life before. So we have now a choice to continue to live like this or allowing the Holy Spirit who is now in us to help us overcome all the struggles that we have with sin. Before we were in bondage, we were slave to sin, but not anymore. Now we have the Holy Spirit to help us. So if we let the Holy Spirit, then we will be able to win the battle against the sinfulness of our lives. Then you will truly live. So that's another level that we climb. Right now we come to verse 17 and we go to the next step of the ladder. Now we are children. Before it was those who are in Christ. Now we climb another ladder. We are children. And then you climb another ladder, another step of the ladder. We are heirs. Wow, that's getting more glorious. And another one, we get to be co-heirs with Christ. From being those, we become sons, then we become heirs and heirs of the glory of God. So we climb to the maximum, the highest stage of the ladder. This is a very big change of identity, don't you think so? From being those to being heirs in Christ, hallelujah. Know that. We have to answer that question. So who are the heirs of God? Anybody can be heirs of God? It's not by birth that we become heirs of God. Here the scriptures tell us, if we are his children. So the qualification to become a child of God and an heir of God is to become a child, to, to become born, born again. You know, you have heard many people say in the past, oh, we are all children of God. Like all religions are good, it doesn't matter, we are all creation of creature of God. That's a false statement. The Bible is very clear. Because of what took place in the Garden of Eden, the fall of man, this right to this inheritance that God had for us has been robbed, has been taken. We have lost the right to this inheritance. All the glory that God created us for, all this fellowship, we lost it. We have no right to that anymore. The Bible is very clear about what we were and what we are entitled to. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3, and we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That is what we were. That is what we, had, uh, we were entitled to before we were justified by Christ Jesus on the cross, by believing. Whatever you may think of yourself this morning, by comparing yourself to someone else, oh, I'm better of that person. I'm not as bad as this one. I have more good than bad in my life, or whatever. It will not qualify you for the inheritance. There's only one thing that will qualify you for the inheritance of God is, are you a child of God? Are you born again? Are you a Christian? Yes or no? There is no in between. There's no gray areas. There's no religious states and the law or whatever it is. You have to be born again. It depends. Your future depends on that. How can I be sure? To be, that I am a child of God. Let's look at the next, next slide, verse 14 to 16. We'll see a few answers uh, to that question. How can I be sure that I am a child of God? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I have added a word here, absolutely. Because actually, I did not add it. It belongs there. Because the, the not, the not here has this uh, absolutely. It's like a statement of emphasis that God is telling us. He's, he's really telling us the word that is there, that it is more than just a certainty. He wants you to be sure of that. This, the, the spirit that you have received, the spirit that lives in you, is absolutely not a spirit of fear, a spirit of bondage, a spirit of slavery. You have been receiving another kind of spirit, the spirit of God, a spirit of sonship, a spirit that makes you become and makes you also feel and makes you know that you have been through a change of identity and now you are not this slave. Also this, uh, this, this uh, verb here, when it says, 
those who are led by the Spirit of God, it's, we're not talking here only about uh, turn right, turn left, the Holy Spirit will tell you how to this, that. We're not talking about this guidance and decision making. We're talking something deeper than that. Because the context of this chapter is about the struggle with the, the sinful impulse of our life, the flesh, the, the sinful body, the, the things, the evil things that we used to do and that we used to be slave of. So that's the context of that, the struggle of the new spiritual life with the struggle with the old life. That's the, the context of that. So he said, when it says here, those who are led by the Spirit, it's, it's in that, we apply it in that context absolutely, that it means that it is the Holy Spirit to enable you, if you let him do, enable you to fight over the, the, old, the old fight of your sin and, and make you uh, really, it gives you an evidence, it reassures you that you are a child of God. So it's more than guidance, it is like a parent that trains up or brings up a child. This is the, the verb here, led, means bring up in the new mode of life. So that's the Holy Spirit is helping you to take you from a former lifestyle that was dominated by the sinful impulse and he's bringing you up as a parent, as a trainer at the gym or as a teacher in the school to learn a better way of life and to be equipped for that life. So that's what it means here. Also another thing that may help you to realize if you are a, a, a son of God or not is like uh, the likeness of God. If you are born of God you have inherited some characteristic, some likeness to the father or the mother that you have. If, if for instance, a Jix uh, comes to me one day and she tells me, uh, I am the, the son of so and so, and I know so and so, I'm a friend with him, then I will look at her face and I was, oh yeah, I can see, same nose as your dad. I see your eyes of your mother. I will see some resemblance of something. So if you are born of God, you should have in some way some characteristic that resemble your father and, and, uh, and, and nature and character. So that is something important to realize for us today. Other things that you may see if the Spirit of God is at work, some signs that the Spirit of God it would be. The first one normally is, the, is uh, related to the Word of God. If you are like me, I've been in a boarding school, a religious boarding school for four years from uh, until I was 16 years old. I was reading the Bible. Actually, I was forced to read the Bible and uh, forced to, to participate in the, the religious uh, rituals and everything. But I never got anything from the Word of God. It was like passing me by, you know, like I did not really relate to that. This was meaning this until I turned 25 years old and I was born again. The first thing that happened as a sign that I was now a child of God is my interest for the Word of God, my understanding for the Word of God, uh, the discovery, the, the, the richness. I remember I was so amazed, I was so curious, I was so interested in the Word of God. And that is one of the words of the Holy Spirit, to be taught by the Spirit, to open our mind to understand the Word of God. That's one, that's one sign that the Holy Spirit has been at work into your life. Another one is prayers. Are you taken to prayer sometimes, like uh, have a burden or a, a sudden, uh, feel a sudden need to pray? Before, you didn't have these kind of things. You didn't pray to, to, uh, in a closeness to a heavenly Father who was hearing you, you know? Sometimes if you would pray, it would be like more like a superstitious kind of prayer. Burn a candle and receive a blessing or something like that or uh, you know do a good deeds and receive a, another kind of thing more like in a ritualistic approach to prayer and sometimes when you had a big need and going through a big crisis oh god and then the rest of your life was living uh, without god but now that you are born again it just comes spontaneously, sometimes, inspiration to pray, an urgency to pray, a need and a connection with God. Another thing that is an indication whether we are children of God is like uh, 
the love that we begin to feel for our brothers and our sisters, our connection with the family of God, the church, the need to go to church, the, 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 that connection. I remember some of you will be horrified by what I will say. Uh, but anyway, please forgive me in advance. <laughs> After I was born again, I was, I, was really, I was really an extremist. I've always been a bit extremist. For the devil before I was born again and for God when I, after I was born again. One day I sat in front of my mom and I told her something really horrible. I told my mom, I says, you know mom, I really love you. I love my family. But to tell you the truth, I love my Christian family more. <laughs> wow, that's bad, eh? That's really bad. But my mom, knowing me, and being very gracious, forgave me to see that. And instead, she understood what I was trying to say because she knew, she knew me and my personality. I was just trying to tell her how excited, how blessed, uh, how I was uh, happy in this uh, the new life that I had found, the connection with the church, the ministry, uh, this new life related to the, the church. So she understood that. So I told you it was horrible, so forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> so th these are signs that already indicate in some ways, some signs that the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. Because we were not like that before. And then suddenly these interests, these areas become alive. Esp especially with the Christ-likeness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit and all this. Verse 16 says, the Holy Spirit testify with our spirit that we are God's children. But before we go that, let's look at verse 15. Verse 15 is also very important because it brings up a, a, a term that we need to understand this morning. For you have absolutely not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. And this is an illustration that is very important in the book of Romans because it, Paul is giving us an illustration coming from the Roman law, the Roman Empire, the legal system of the Roman Empire. And you have two, two extremes. The slave that was the lowest, like a non-human being, just like... You could have a dog or a slave, and it would be the, the same thing in the society. No right uh, could be abused, could be killed. Just uh, if the master was in a bad mood, one day could cut his head or whatever. And no right, no, 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 no dignity, no respect, anything. So here you, are, you have not received this kind of fearful, to, to go back into that kind of uh, 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 lack of safety and uh, fear of what you could have been because now you have received something more. You have received a spirit of sonship. You have changed your status. Under Roman law, you would get all the civil rights, all the, the, the property, all the possessions, but the civil rights that you are entitled to everything under, under this, this new rule. And for us, it gives us a, a picture that is important. From bondage to sin, we have been freed, we have been adopted, we are totally a new relationship with God. And we cry, Abba, Father. This is something also that is another, another proof for us. Inside of your heart, something that wasn't there before, a spiritual, emotional, deep-hearted response to God. This connection, this, this uh, assurance, my father, my father loves me, I love, I love my father. G. L. Parker, which is a, a theologian, a great writer, Christian writer, says, adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel, offered by the gospel, the highest, more better than the uh, justification. And why is that like this? When you are justified, you are declared not guilty. You're right. So you are a criminal. You are declared not guilty. You can go. You're free. That's great. We have all the reason to rejoice. But that's still a difference between you are my son. You see the difference? To be a criminal sent free of, of, of guilt is good. 
but to be called my son, my heir, to have all the rights in society, to be completely redeemed and to be exalted to the highest dignity, it's much better And that relationship. So adoption is the highest form of a relationship, the highest privilege. It is the height of our Christian walk. You know, if we would just realize what we have in Christ as we have here, this is the, the f fund foundation of our Christian world. It's the heart of our prayer. It's the heart of everything that we are, of our personality and our identity in Christ. Uh, adoption is the base of Christian prayer. Remember when Jesus taught us how to pray? How do we address our Father? How do we address God? Our Father in heaven. So already these connections of Abba Father has been introduced by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in the book of Romans here, this chapter, we have two expressions that are important. One is children, children of God, and the other one is heir of God, or adopted by God. So why, why do we uh, have these two expressions? It's to highlight different aspects of our, of our relationship. You remember in Romans, Paul talks that we are all born into Adam's, Adam's family. We come from Adam and Eve, our first parents. We inherited the nature of our parents, the sinfulness, the defects, and all the problems. It was passed on to us by natural birth. So by nature, we are not part of God's family. We are part of Adam's family with all that comes with it. So. In Christ Jesus, we have been made righteous. This has been dealt with. We have been declared right with God, accepted by God, and we have been born again into a new family. But more than that, we have been adopted, so that signifies all the legal rights, all the inheritance is, is, is ours. So that's what we are learning and the benefits of being justified. Justified, made right, born again, adopted, and have a right to the uh, inheritance. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself who you are really. And realize and go to work with that confidence. I am a child of God. I belong to Him. He loves me. I am the heir of God, and I have access to all of His grace, I have access to His inheritance, and I am co-heir with Jesus Christ. Go and work with that, and you will see your life will be different. Because you are God's child, God loves you, God protects you, God provides for you, God plans for you the best, God hears you, and so much more benefit that we have in Christ. All of your ultimate destiny depends on these questions. Are you or not a child of God? That is very important. If you are not a child of God, you have no inheritance. You are outside of this covenant. You are all alone in the world without God in this world, a child of wrath. The Bible is clear. And many times we, with, a religious, with our religious view, we confuse all the, 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 the things. But with the word of God, it's so clear. You are this or you are that. You belong or you don't. You are saved or not. You are a child of God or you are not. It's nothing in between. You need to know who you are, and the Bible is helping us to, to, to understand that. Verse 16, the Spirit himself, and this is the deepest level of assurance. When you have that, you know where you stand. The Spirit himself testify with our spirit that we are children of God. Wow, this is like when you get that deep conviction beyond emotions, beyond feelings, it's set there, it's cleared up, this is what God is telling you, and it, you, you accept it at the bottom of your heart. I remember, and maybe some of you would also, uh, in a similar, if you uh, experience a similar experience as I did when I was saved. The night I was born again, I knew that night that I had been going through an experience, a transformation. 
I repented, I received God as my Lord and Master in my life, and I knew, I went to the prayers, I did the sinner prayers, I felt, and I'm not making it up, just, just using Christian vocabularies, this is my experience, the burden of my sin lifted from my, uh, my shoulder. This I remember so clearly. And also, uh, a, a lot of things changed in me. I felt that, that change, that transformation. I felt that peace that I was looking, I felt that I found something that I was looking for. So when I drove to my mom, I was 25 years old, I drove to my mom's place that night. I came home and I said, Mom, I am born again. I, I did not understand everything in the Bible, but this, I understood it in that night, I understood it, it was clear, it was my experience, and I declared it, and, and that's, that's it, I, I felt, and I knew that it was, and uh, the peace of God came in me. I read a testimony this week, it's a preacher, a very well-known preacher. He says he received Jesus Christ, he was 11 years old. He lived on the farm, they went to church, and when he was going to church and they would sing these wonderful Christian songs and hymns, he would cry. He, tears would come on his face because he had this sensitive heart for God. And when he would go and take care of the cows, he, he felt a calling of God in his life, so he would preach to the cows. <laughs> and and he, he, he says the cows were very good listeners because they never fell asleep. And sometimes, sometimes they would say, hmm. Yeah. So anyway, this one I just added it to this uh, sister story. Okay. Then after that, he moved to another state, and nearby there were no church. And it was now he was a, a teen, and then he went to university, and he says, I drifted away in these years, having no fellowship, no Christian church. I drifted away, and I was led to do bad things and things that I was ashamed of. And at one point he came to a place and his relationship and his understanding of God that he declared that he did not believe anymore in the inspiration of scriptures. That's how far he drifted away from God. But he says that even during these years, I felt down, deep down, that there was still a relationship with God that I could not deny. He says that's an encouragement for maybe for you this morning. If you fell away from God and you feel you know, disconnected from God for whatever reason that you may have been true to in your life, there's still hope for you. Because if at some point you felt this deep conviction, you, ha you knew that you have had this relationship of sonship with God, this doesn't just go away just like that. You may f have been away, drifting away, but there's something that attached you to that experience, uh, that certainty. So this preacher says, even when I was away at that point, I felt that deep down inside of me, I still had this connection. And I, I, can, I can say that because of uh, some of my children who are not following God like you and I, we are going to church and some things, they still have this connection, they still pray, they still sometimes read the scriptures, and they, 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 they are res very respectful of God in and, and, and their, and their own way. But it's just that they are not walking the, 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 the walk like you, and we are still praying. But that encouraged me because he, even though in years where he was drifting away from God, deep down he knew that there was a connection with God. He says, somehow deep down inside, I knew I still belonged to him. And because of that, something here that's important, when I was tempted to do certain really bad things, I didn't dare to do it. There was still the witness of the Spirit. And that, that is important for you if you're going through a big, big, difficult time, a wilderness experience, or if you have friends who have been Christians and have been walking away from God, don't get discouraged about your friends or your relatives who followed God before, because if there is a witness of the Spirit that was there, it will, it's still there. So just pray to, to revive and bring it back up, and then we, we know that God is powerful. So that's really, really important in our walk with the Lord. And uh, Okay, let's go to the next slide. If we are His children, then we are His heirs also. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ. This is the highest step of the ladder. 
we see what God has in mind here. That's the glory for you and for me. So when you feel down, you feel rejected, you, you're losing your mind, the pressure of life are too much for you, your family, your circumstance, people are disappointing you. Uh, you know, like when you're crushed and you're broken, know what you have. Know what God has in mind for you. It is mind-blowing. It's beyond descriptions. What kind of inheritance is awaiting you in the future? Let's go to the next slide, and we will look at some of the descriptions of this inheritance. I want you this morning to relax here and to be comforted and to s quietly and, you know, deep down set something here in your heart that will keep you going, that will be a fuel for your spiritual engine for the rest of your days. Heirs of all things, heirs of God and heirs of all things. And Revelation 21.7 says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. Do you know anybody else who can inherit all things? You can have the richest man in the world. Think about this, how rich he is. Does he own everything? No. He owns a lot of things, but he doesn't own everything. But you, even the poorest of any Christians in any dark places of the world, can inherit all things. I'm not the one saying that, and I'm not telling you that I understand how it is, you know, does this make sense. I don't understand. It's beyond my understanding. But I believe it. Because that's what the Bible says. I am heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And I am to inherit all things because it belongs to us. That's the extent of your inheritance. All things. And 1 Corinthians, Paul says, all things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollos, Cephas, the world, life, death, things present or things to come, all are yours. That's how big your uh, inheritance can be. Are you happy of that today? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Then you have uh, the list continues. Heirs of salvation. Heirs of eternal life. These are giving us like something to uh, know in our experience, in our future. Heirs of the promise. The context of that verse is that when God promised to Abraham and he swore by himself. To make sure that this promise is not questionable. It's not an option. It's an absolute certainty. Heirs of the promise. Any promise. All the promises of God. The riches of his promise. When it says the windows of heaven. The resources of God. The best of the best that God has. We are heirs of the promise. The promise that we're not under a curse. The promise of everything God has sent Jesus to do. Amen? Hallelujah. Here is of the grace of life. The grace of life here is a wonderful context because it's in the context of marriage. The word of God is very practical. It says here, husband, love your wife, treat them with respect because she is co-heirs with you of the grace of life. The same grace of life. If you don't do it, then you are entering your own prayers. Your prayers are not going to work. So you cannot be, uh, you know, uh, a Christian going to church and then thinking that you are right with God if you have, are conflicts with your wife and you are not nice to one another, husband and wife. So that is, you are heirs of the grace of life. You enjoy all the benefit of being Christian together. Imagine a home that know that and lives in this way. Heirs of the righteousness and Hebrew chapter 11, the, the heroes of faith, heirs of righteousness. You can also be a hero of faith, just like all the list of these heroes. Because of your faith, you inherit the effect of that righteousness, and you can you know, move mountains, uh, uh, win kingdoms, go against the water and the fire, and win the victories, and go through any, any hardship. And here's in James, you have ears of the kingdom. What kind of kingdom? Who owns a kingdom? Jesus Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. His kingdom will never be shaken. His kingdom has no end. He rules over everything. Is that right? Do you believe that? Yes. yes. Well, good news for you. Because he rules, he makes you rule with him. 
because that text here says, uh, and uh, verse 17 says, we are co-heirs with Christ. And that is the wonderful thing. Everything that Christ has, everything that he is, everything that he is going to be, everything that he is going to own, is yours to be shared with. And it is his desire. Uh, we have done nothing to, to gain that. I, I, is he a king? You will be made king. Is he a priest? He makes you a kingdom of priests. Uh, does he sit on the throne? He will make you sit on the throne with him. Think about it. Uh, you, will he judge the nations? He will make you judge the nation with him. Will he receive the triumph from his father? You will receive your triumph also when he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. So everything, every type of uh, reward that Christ will have for who he is, for what he has done, for his role in our salvation is for us. Remember the prayer that Jesus did? Father, I ask you that they will be with me that they will share with me, that they will see the glory that I had before the world was born, that they will know that, that they will be with me to say that. And many other texts where Jesus says in the book of Revelation and in the gospel, you will sit on thrones, you will sit the nations, you will be with me. And in the book of Revelation, it is repeated in many ways. That's you and that's me because we are co-heirs with Christ. And that is wonderful. Amen? Hallelujah. Heirs of all that God possess. Suppose that you are heir of a poor man. Any of you know that experience? I'm a heir of a poor woman. And this poor man or woman, your mother or your father, owns an old cottage that is worth about nothing. When he or she dies, you will inherit this poor cottage. Is that right? That's the inheritance you will have. But suppose you instead, you are the heir of a king. Oh, that's different. He will take you on his helicopter and he will bring you over hills and show all the cattle and the hills and the land and says, Hey, son, this is yours. Hey, that's, that's better, isn't it? And imagine, multiply that many, many times for God. So not only you are heirs of God's possessions, but you are heirs of God himself. God's attributes, God's character. His omnipotence is yours. Hey, say amen. amen. His omniscience and all his wisdom is available to you. His unfailing love belongs to you. He cares for you. He loves you. But one thing that really tickled my, my brain this morning when I was thinking about that, the, the sharing of his plan. Remember when he met with Abraham looking at uh, the, the, the Sodom and Gomorrah? Can I hide to my friend Abraham what I'm going to do? So you and I, because we are God's heir, we have access to the sharing of God's plan, sharing of his heart, to understanding where God is going, what God is, wants to do. And that is through the Holy Spirit, of course, but what are the plans of God for his church? What are the plans of God for your life? What is God intending to do, his desire for your life? You are entitled to that. That's why Prophet Jeremiah says, call upon me. And I will reveal to you secret things that nobody knows about, never revealed before, just for you. Another place he says, uh, will not God reveal to his prophets everything that he has in mind? So God has the heart to reveal. And because you are heirs of God, you have access to the heart, to the sharing of God's heart. Say amen to that one because that's a really good one. And the loving presence, you, you're walking with God. Remember when God came in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden? Why? Just to fellowship, just to enjoy, for no other reason than just be in the loving presence of God. Wouldn't you like that? It's already yours. Just take it. Amen? Amen? Just take it. Hallelujah. Just take it. Hallelujah. Have you ever dreamed about what might be like in your life if you would be born in a wealthy, wealthy family? Yeah, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. Okay. 
From what we read in the headlines, many of these heirs are not happy. They go to court, they kill each other, they fight, they try to grab the, uh, each other's inheritance, that's right? They yeah. divorce, they hate, they, they dirty each other's reputation. But think about it, as a child of God, the creator of the universe, you don't need to fear whether your brothers and sisters will steal your inheritance or they're part of your inheritance. You are co-heir with Jesus Christ. For sure it's big enough and God is already big. Hallelujah. Oh, that's wonderful. Joint heirs with Christ Jesus. Hey, did you know you are not to be a heir by yourself? You will not inherit by yourself? You cannot. You cannot inherit by yourself. Your right to the inheritance is linked directly to Jesus' right to his inheritance. Without his right, you have no right. Your right. And you know why? It's because Jesus wants to share his right with you. You have done nothing. You just receive it. But Jesus, that's what, that's how, it, this, this message give me a, a deeper understanding of the undeserved privilege of God's grace to a, to a different level. When I think of all I inherit doing nothing, not deserving anything, having not participated in anything, having not lifted the finger, nothing. All I deserve, I was a children of wrath. Instead, Christ, who has done everything, he decides, don't worry, everything I own is yours. I, that's my desire. I'm going to share. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to reign with me. You're going to rule with me. You're going to judge with me. You're, everything that Jesus has is for you, not for you alone. So better exercise yourself to walk in sweet fellowship with Christ because he loves you so much. Actually, this chapter finished with the supreme declaration. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing in this life, nothing in the life to come, nothing spiritual, no, no kingdom, no rich, poor, whatever it is. Only the love of Christ. How great will the inheritance of Christ be? be. Think about that. The Father, who is the creator of all things, the owners of all universe, is going to reward his obedient son who humbled himself unto death. He made himself on the form of a human being, lower than a human being into a criminal, a servant. He died for us he was obedient until death. What kind of reward should he receive? What kind of reward will the Father bestow upon Jesus Christ? Wow, that's great, isn't it? If you just think in this way, does he deserve that? Does he have a right to that? Yes, so that inheritance is yours. He will share all of this with you. That's how big it is. So if you look, uh, go to the next slide, Andreas, please. The, the last one. Last, yeah, okay, this one. Look at the last part and we finish with that. If indeed we share in his suffering. So we are his children, we are heirs, we are fellow heirs, and we share everything that Christ <coughs> has. It's all ours. If indeed we share in his suffering so that we may also share in his glory. Oh, pastor, why are you bringing suffering and that wonderful message of hope? Now we were having fun thinking of all the riches and the prosperity that Christ and the blessing and now you bring this suffering again. Why is that? You know, Because Paul is a realistic pastor. He's not one of these false preachers that preach a cheap gospel, a gospel that is not true, that is not going to happen, a gospel that has no, no only health and wealth gospel. We, we know it's not working with that. All of us have not immune to the trouble of this life. Jesus Christ, the heir of all things, went to the cross. The cross was in his, with his inheritance. Did you know that? He came for that reason, he inherited of that. And he says, we are carrying our cross. He warns us in John chapter 15, you will be hated again for my name. 
they will persecute you. The same way they treated me, they will treat you. So Paul is, is honest. Paul is saying, listen, this glory, this inheritance is yours, but it comes attached to the life, to the, the reality of living in a fallen world. We are living in a broken world. We are living in a messed up world. We are living in a world of darkness, a world of hatred, of bitterness, of jealousy, of uh, violence. This is this world. People are killing each other. They are hating each other. They are doing all sorts of things to each other. We come out of a world like that. We belong to that world. But by His undeserved grace, we came out and now we instead we inherit all of these wonderful privileges. But as we have to go on until the glory to come, to walk in this broken, fallen world, we will have troubles because we represent him. We have the privilege of having his name, his riches, the experience of his grace. All the access to God's character, God's possessions and Christ. But one of the inheritance of Christ was the cross. And one of his inheritance is the nations. Give me all the nations. Remember these Psalms? Ask of me and I will give you. Brother Stephen, why don't we sing that song? Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, that one song. Uh, it's just come to my mind. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay, but please come. We're finishing. Hallelujah. It's just as, but might as well see it while, while, while we're thinking of it. Because I'm thinking, this is part of the inheritance of Christ. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations. Wow! Hey, listen, everybody. Don't look at Pastor Jennifer. Look at me. <laughs> I, know, I know she's very pretty and all this. Yes. Yes. <laughs> But you understand what I'm saying. It's part the suffering, the cross, the nations are the inheritance of the Lord. The Lord left us here and he gave us everything we need and the Holy Spirit to fulfill this inheritance in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let me finish with a story. When you go through trouble, remember what you have. Remember who you are, because when you remember who you are, you will walk like you are. You will start walking and acting and speaking like what you are meant to be. Okay, a, 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 a story here finishing. This story comes from John Newton, who used to be a slave trader, converted to Christ and wrote some hymns of the Christian faith. And he's telling that story. I just changed the story a little bit to make it more modern because he was walking with a cart and horses. So I'm walking with a car and a flat tire instead, okay? Suppose someone was going to a city to meet a lawyer so that he would take possessions of a huge estate, a huge property worth millions and millions of dollars. But just before reaching out to town, maybe two miles before town, he's got a flat tire, oh bummer. And because his car is a flat tower, there's no traffic, there's no passerby, there's no other cars, there's no people to walk him. He has to walk to town. Think about this man. He's going to get the richest inheritance of his life, an estate that worth millions and millions. And he's walking to two miles. Oh, my flat tire. Oh, my flat tire. Oh, my flat tire. Ah, just flat tires. What would you think of him? He's just about to get the richest inheritance possible, but he's just, you know, complaining and moaning about his flat tire. <laughs> Does that resemble some of us? Yes. Yes? yes. We are not looking at the rich inheritance of Christ. We're just complaining about the flat tires. Is your car broken this morning? Sometimes. Sometimes yes. your car is broken. If your car is broken, just keep on going. Amen. Keep on walking. That rich inheritance and eternal glory is just ahead. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready for glory? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us sing this wonderful song because it looks at the inheritance that we have in Christ Jesus.